Hello, my name is David Bailey. Welcome to Community Engagement as part of Build 2011 Project Appraisal. We today gather on Ghana country and we, I acknowledge very much the elders of the past and elders of the current and elders of the future emerging. This is a picture of Uncle Frank Wanganee who had just done Welcome to Country at Lunar New Year in Chinatown a few years back. <clears throat> and I love this photograph because it's just welcoming, isn't it? So it's a great, great thing. A little bit about myself. Um, a few years back, I was made a fellow of the Planning Institute of Australia. That was where the peers in the town planning sector thought I, I, I had some wisdom. I myself have spent quite a lot of time in local government, uh, 16 years or so at the City of Adelaide, including a stint back in the early 90s, uh, about 10 years at the City of Charles Sturt. Um, and both of those places have been involved in uh, long-term planning, long, long, long sort of strategic planning, neighbourhood planning, and uh, zoning amendments and those sorts of things. Uh, I've been on the Holfast Bay Council Assessment Panel for the last five years as an independent and currently presiding member there. Uh, dabbled a little bit with the Tiny House Association, Uniting Church Property, uh, <clears throat> and more recently have started my own planning practice called Community Place Planning. So, recognising uh, you are in interested in buildings, construction, architecture, property, planning, how you can engage about a building proposal. The fundamentals is to understand your situation. Who are the community members? Who are the stakeholders interested in the building and its potential impacts? Analyze those uh, particular stakeholders, interests, around how, how you can build trust with them. It's all about trusting relationships, engagement, and then implement the methods, the communication methods, and monitor monitor that over time. No matter where you are looking at a particular building, particular property, you have to ask yourself the question, is there things here that is sensitive to the community, to residents, and that we will Create, create a sensitivity that will get itself into the political arena. I ask yourself some questions like, is the building I'm working on or is there something nearby that is valued for what it is, be it built heritage, cultural heritage or natural heritage? Be aware of that. Does your proposal involve or does it directly impact vulnerable people, children, older people, people with disabilities? Does it involve risk to the environment? Does, it, does your proposal lead to some sort of pollution or noise or dust or odour? These things are sensitive <clears throat> and it's helpful to recognise them. So listen to your gut instinct and start with questions around identifying you know, whether or not your building proposal is community or politically sensitive. And if you get nervous, discuss it with a council planner and call an expert. So community engagement, it can be done well and can add value to buildings and situations. A bit like when you start to plan an actual building, you actually have a plan. You know, you've got drawings and specifications and you come to stages and you kind of know how you're going to go about the actual construction of a building. It's fundamentally the same with community engagement. You need a plan around how to do the uh, community engagement. So what are your goals in community engagement? Uh, who are you trying to engage with? And then the tools to engage with those uh, stakeholders and community members. But that needs to be based on understanding of who the stakeholders and community members are and analysis. It really informs which are the best communication tools to use. But be aware of things that are valued by others. It comes out emotionally. And if tricky, remember to call specialists. 
So today we'll touch on a few case studies. We'll look at what is community engagement, why engage, measurable benefits from engagement, effective engagement, managing outrage, and look at some tools. So this is a photograph of the Adelaide Central Market and to the east of it is the Central Market Arcade site. Both these parcels of land and the Hilton Hotel, actually the land that is actually owned by the city of Adelaide. And back in the late 60s, the then elected council um, entered into a ground lease for the arcade site and leased it out to some shopping centre people who built Coles and the, and the shopping centre that's there. And they leased it out for 50 years, during which time you know, it's operated effectively as the arcade. But back in uh, 2013, 2014, the council knew that that lease was coming to expire in 2018. And they wanted to know, what should we do with the site? How can we best capitalise on its site? Uh, what can we do with it? What should we do with it? But they were smart enough to recognise that it was very important to approach that recognising the community value of the markets generally and through a process of extensive engagement. This jumps ahead to the concept of what is being proposed on the site uh, for 2025 or something like that. So this is the arcade site, clearly very different to what it is today. Um, and it recognises uh, the relationship with the buildings here, ground level, sort of four level podium, but really tall apartments, student housing, offices. That's the Wooden Hotel, so quite, uh, quite a change. So in 2015, recognising the importance to engage locally, and I was heavily involved with this work, there was extensive engagement to create a 10-year strategy for comprehensive multi-themed strategy for the market district as a whole, of which the arcade is a signature project. 2,000 people were involved, uh, workshops online, um, a lot of interviews, and critically, a reference group of key local influencers, people who manage the hotel, Samuel Way, the arcade traders, Central Market Authority, uh, a couple of folks from Chinatown, Guja Street Traders, Great Street Traders, who work through what's our aspirations? What are we hoping to achieve in the future of the market district? And uh, how should we get there? Some pretty practical strategies and goals. That led in, uh, that answered the question for the arcade. Yes, we should develop it. Yes, it should be mixed use, multi-level, and a few other uh, goals. In 2016, a separate piece of work took those higher level aspirations and did a lot more refinement to come up with site specific guiding principles, which were ultimately adopted by the council. In here, the central market land itself is, is or was defined as community land under the local government act and had a community land management plan. But council obviously understood that if the development was to be of interest to the development sector, that community land classification had to be lifted. So there's formal statutory consultation around should this community land revocation uh, occur or not. And, uh, and so the statutory consultation with that, that revocation was eventually uh, undertaken by the Minister for Local Government, which enabled in 2018 the council through Jones Lang LaSalle to commence an international expression of interest process seeking a development partner uh, that expression of interest process sought a partner who was prepared to develop based on the guiding principles, uh, some sort of development which would do that. And after working through all the expressions of interest <clears throat> in 2019, the development partner was announced and was secured. And in 2020, we're now at the stage of having to work through refining the design, secure planning consent, which was secured about a month or so ago, building consent, financial approvals, and looking ahead. This is a development, it's a major development. It's about $400 million. Looking at um, potentially construction over two to three years, 
during which time it would be critical to manage the construction impacts in order to keep local businesses humming. So there's 80 traders in the market proper, 80 in the market plaza to the west in and around Chinatown, and, and probably 60 or 70 along Grote Street and 100 or so along Guja Street. So a major construction project has to be managed in such a way as to enable those businesses to thrive during that time. So it's challenging. But if we reflect on what are the uh, different interests and what are the outcomes they're working towards, the council itself owns the land on behalf of the community, of course. And they're principally interested in the outcome that's based on those guiding principles. Nearby traders uh, are interested in the future for them, business to their trade, uh, business to the front door, and least impacts of the actual construction on trade. As I said, there are 80 traders inside the arcade who are interested in the future, but they won't have a site to trade in. So how do we work through with them um, how they're able to have a business in the future? It's really challenging, but it's been achieved. <clears throat> the public clearly value the market, um, clearly need to understand about uh, the proposal, why it's being done. So fundamentally, the interest is understanding. There's different views in that. Uh, the developers, ICD, they're looking for the outcome and a return and their reputation to be maintained. And the government of South Australia, as one, one stakeholder, um, directly impacted through ownership of the Sami Way building, but more broadly, are really interested in the markets and Chinatown being enhanced as a destination for South Australia as a whole. So this example illustrates engagement through a project lifestyle, starting off at the high level as a long-term strategy, engaging to understand the basic proposal of what to aim for, looking at the guiding principles, the concept of what to aim for, a little bit more refinement, a little bit more detail, and there's engagement with that, and then leading to the on-ground development uh, to bring about the building and the activity aimed for. So a lot of managing the actual construction impacts itself. If you flip down to something not quite so large, to something a little bit more common, uh, residential development often has walls on boundaries. And you could be faced with a situation of where the height of the wall, the length meets the zoning, can be eight and three, but you understand the neighbour is not happy. Now, if you understand the neighbour is not happy, you often understand and uh, maybe they don't like the bulk, maybe they, they'd be concerned about the shadow. Uh, but what can you do if you're building it? If you're uh, a construction person, what can you do? You can inform your neighbours about the proposal and say, well, this is it, this is what it looks like. You can understand that, that's okay. And that may be enough information for the neighbours. Or you can inform and seek comment from them. But what can the neighbour actually influence? Now, you might be prepared to reduce the length of the wall or maybe the height a bit. Um, you may be prepared to negotiate around the colour and materials, but that's about it. So the scope of influence of the neighbours in that case is pretty limited. But that's engagement of some level. To reiterate, a bit like yourselves who are studying to become experts in construction or planning or building, there are engagement experts. So know your expertise limits and be in dialogue around problems and options. And if you're really in trouble, call engagement experts. And they are experts in mediation and facilitation and so forth. <clears throat> a little bit different to marketing, a little bit different to communications, which is tends to be a bit of a one-way thing, but it's not always. Um, but understand engagement experts exist. So, at this part by point, what do you see as the four most sensitive things to the community and politically? <laughs>